Well, differences in quantity sometimes become differences in quality. Uh, my impression is it's basically a difference in scale. Uh, so the practices that were uh, developed in detail uh, to control the Philippine population back in the early 20th century, which were aimed mostly at elites, uh, not so much at the peasantry, they kind of disregarded them, and were very successful in breaking up the nationalist movements and uh, imposing the uh, U.S. dominated system, which so successful that it remains until today. As I think I mentioned, the Philippines are kind of an outlier in East and Southeast Asia, the one area that hasn't really developed uh, the, uh, and has not uh, plenty of struggles, you know, a lot of brutality. So for example, after the Second World War, the U.S. backed a vicious counterinsurgency operation to crush uh, peasant independent rebellions. But Basically, the system has sustained itself, and it was applied at once at home. Uh, this was the early, this is like 1910. Mm -hmm. By 1918, 1919, a few years later, and pretty much the same systems were applied at home in what is, in fact, the most repressive period of American history, the Woodrow Wilson's Red Scare, which was quite vicious and had a long time impact. And then it continues. Uh, the FBI uh, used the same techniques to try to, again, aim mainly at the political elite to try to ensure that uh, uh, senators, congressional representatives, others would uh, not get out of line because they'd have a ton of information about them and they could use it to uh, slander them, to libel them, to initiate stories and so on. By the 1960s and 70s, who is being directed against the entire population. That's the COINTEL Pro uh, uh, operations, uh, pr primarily under the Democratic administrations of the 60s and then Nixon when it was finally terminated by the courts, but uh, uh, very similar operations, uh, but in this case uh, directed against uh, uh, the Native American movements, the uh, the, the New Left, the Black Nationalist movements, the women's movements, and it was pretty serious. It led as far as uh, literal political assassination, uh, forcing suicides, uh, breaking up groups. Uh, and, uh, that, that was a massive operation. It's, uh, it's pretty hard to think of, I mean, outside of, say, East Germany and so on. It's, hard to think of a comparable operation in a Western society aimed at uh, undermining the state, and it's the state, it's the national political police, that's what the FBI is, mm -hmm. under executive orders, uh, trying to break up and disrupt uh, popular activism, which was quite a significant force in the 60s and early 70s, and had substantial success. Uh, this uh, now takes it up uh, on a broader scale. Okay. But this is the kind of thing you'd expect a system of power to do. The more information they have about people, uh, the better able they are, at least think they are, to uh, control and monitor and undermine them if necessary. So that's also the... the, the you think uh, power can exist? So th there is this idea that uh, information is power and your activism uh, is very linked to this idea that you have to empower people by providing them accurate information on the world and in the different structures of power. Uh, do you think that the... I mean, do you think that secret is necessary to form a power? Do you think that... Secrecy is valuable. Actually, the United States is an unusually open society. Mm -hmm. uh, we have more access to internal planning records in the United States than any country that I know of. It's by no means perfect, but uh, it's substantial. And when you read through these masses of internal documents, secret documents, as I've done in many cases, one thing is quite striking. Very little has any meaningful relation to any real security issue. Most of it is defending the state against the population. 
They don't want people to know what they're doing, so it's secret. Uh, but there's very little in the secret record that would be of, would have been of value, let's say, to the Russians or the Chinese or whoever, the Cubans, whoever they thought they were fighting. They usually knew it perfectly well just from what was happening on the ground. Uh, but it does maintain secrecy from the population. And the tacit assumption is, sometimes overt, that people shouldn't know these things. There is, after all, it's worth remembering, a, a leading theme of liberal, progressive, democratic theory, which says that people should not know. You find that expressed uh, overtly often in some of the leading figures, so the leading uh, public intellectual of the 20th century in the United States, uh, Walter Lippmann, who was a very distinguished figure. He was a progressive uh, Wilson, uh, Roosevelt, uh, Kennedy-style progressive uh, leading commentator on public affairs. He was also the author of uh, what are called uh, uh, essays in democratic and progressive democratic theory. And when you read them, what he says is, uh, I'll quote, he says, the public are ignorant and meddlesome outsiders. They have to be put in their place. Uh, decisions have to be made by the responsible men, people like us. The people who write this are always among the responsible men. Uh, the, uh, we, and we, the responsible men, have to be protected from the trampling and the roar of the bewildered herd, the ignorant and meddlesome outsiders. Uh, and uh, the, the job of uh, what he called manufacturing consent, we, I borrowed his term for a book, but it's his. The job of manufacturing consent is to ensure that the public is marginalized, put in their place in his phrase. They can be spectators, but not participants. They do have a role in a political system. Every couple of years, they're allowed to lend their weight to one or another of the responsible men, and then they should go home and keep quiet. Uh, th that's the, and this is quite common. I mean, the founder of modern uh, modern political science, Harold Laswell, one of the leading figures, also a kind of a, prog a progressive, you know, by U.S. standards, a leftist progressive. Uh, he said we should not be led, misled by democratic dogmatisms about uh, people being the best judges of their own interests. They're not. They're too stupid, they're too ignorant. It would be unfair to allow them to make decisions, kind of like letting a three-year-old run into the street, you know, they're not capable. So for their own benefit, uh, we should control and uh, uh, control them, limit what they do, uh, keep them to the status of uh, uh, observers, spectators of what happens in the political arena. And this is pretty much the way things work. So if you look at uh, you know, academic political science in the United States, one of the major topics that it studies, and studies very well, is the relation between public attitudes and public policy. It's a straightforward inquiry. Public policy, you see it. Uh, public attitudes are uh, available from extensive polling. Polling isn't perfect, but it's pretty good and pretty reliable, and often polls are done quite sensibly. And there's a massive information about public attitudes and public policy, and there are results uh, in the major you know, kind of gold standard works of political science. Basic result is that about 70% of the population, lower 70% on the income scale, is literally disenfranchised. Uh, their attitudes have absolutely no effect on policy their representatives pay no attention to them, literally. So whatever they think is disregarded. As you move up the scale, you start getting a little more influence, that is, more relation between attitudes and policy. And when you get to the very top, which is a fraction of 1%, they're basically making policy. And so they get what they want. Uh, you know, this little 
fuzziness around the edges, but that's the basic picture. Uh, just recently there was a study by, uh, released by Princeton University, which got a little publicity, two leading uh, political scientists who've worked on these things for years investigated, I think, about 1,700 major public policy decisions to investigate who had influence. Uh, same result. Uh, basically, the public was irrelevant, uh, almost all of it. And uh, when you get to the business world, and, you know, extreme wealth and so on, they have enormous influence. Actually, creation of policy, because they usually staff the executive, either they or their representatives. Somebody like, say, Henry Kissinger, representative of the corporate system, uh, but uh, state corporate system. But, uh, but this is the way it works, and that's uh, considered appropriate in progressive democratic theory uh, for the for the for the good of the population. Always, it's out of benevolence. Mm -hmm. You cannot let these ignorant and meddlesome outsiders uh, make uh, bad decisions be terrible. When you look at the secrecy system, that's what a lot of it is about. I'd say the overwhelming majority, keeping the ignorant and meddlesome outsiders in the dark. It's not their business. Because you think that, for example, what happened with Snowden, that he, he, he leaked all these documents, you think that the fact that this, if this information reaches uh, the masses, which is not sure also, we don't know if, if they're, they're really aware of the full extent, and of the political implications, you think it could empower them, or do you think they're anyway marginalized by the system, and it would be maybe the upper classes that could that need also this information? Well, I think the passionate uh, attack on Snowden, you know, the, as soon as this started, with high-level claims that we're going to hunt him to the end of the world, and we'll catch him wherever he is, and we'll punish him. I mean, it shows that they're really afraid. Now, it could be that the fear is paranoia. So, for example, if uh, at the highest level, say, you know, the White House and so on, if they had simply disregarded him, it might have just disappeared, uh, possible. So their own paranoia may be feeding the system, uh, their own demise in a sense. But it does reflect the attitudes. Uh, how much effect it can have, well, we're not sure. So, for example, there were effects. Uh, in Brazil, for example, withdrew uh, the, a presidential visit. Uh, didn't quite break relations, but certainly harmed them. And remember, a lot of these Snowden revelations uh, are not just about surveillance of people. They're also about uh, support for corporate efforts to undermine business in other countries. So, spying on you know, the negotiators and uh, energy deals to make sure that American corporations uh, uh, have a head up on it and so on. Uh, now, you know, big corporations in other countries don't like that, just like uh, Merkel doesn't like the fact that somebody's reading her email, you know. But uh, uh, powerful people and powerful institutions are being harmed sufficiently so that there was a reaction uh, the Congress did start to get concerned when it turned out that uh, the uh, the Senate committees responsible for this were being spied on. Uh, I should say there's absolutely nothing new about this. So, for example, you go back to the foundation of the United Nations. It was uh, there was a conference in San Francisco. I think it was 1947, which established the United Nations. Well, it turned out pretty soon that uh, they discovered that the FBI had been bugging uh, the offices of the foreign delegations uh, so that American negotiators could have a step up on trying to get what they wanted. Uh, uh, you know, it, it's a huge fuss made when the Russians do this to the American embassy, of course, but it's done all the time. At this geopolitical scale, I had a question uh, coming back to what you said about Philippines and the fact that uh, what, the, the, the strategy put in place by the U.S. has still effects more than a hundred years later. How, how can we explain that Latin America has been one of the strongest, uh, has had one of the strongest reactions to all these 
mass surveillance, whereas we know that the U.S. has always has a very actually it's a very it's a very significant phenomenon, really historic significance. Uh, for 500 years, the Latin America had been pretty much in the hands of foreign powers mm -hmm. and uh, uh, elite, mostly white elites, tiny elites inside Latin America who accumulated enormous wealth and huge, horrendous poverty and basically rich societies, and always with, uh, under, under the hands of the imperial powers. Uh, for a long time it was England, and last century or so it's the United States. Uh, Latin America was so taken for granted in U.S. planning uh, that they really hardly even had plans for it. Uh, so uh, there, there were some. So, for example, in 1945, when the U.S. was beginning the organization of the world at the end of the Second World War, the U.S. did call a hemispheric conference uh, in Mexico, uh, and the Latin American states came, and the United States imposed, at that point the U.S. could actually impose what it wanted, imposed what was called an economic charter for the Americas, which banned economic nationalism in all its forms. Uh, the Latin American countries had to follow, com had to be completely open societies, mm -hmm. which of course in, in fact meant open to U.S. penetration and control. It wasn't reciprocal. Mm -hmm. Uh, and incidentally, the U.S. itself did not accept these principles. Mm -hmm. On the contrary, it had a uh, high level of economic nationalism. Uh, that's why you have your computer and you're using the internet and so on, all largely state sector actions. And this was, they were concerned at the time with what the State Department called uh, the new nationalism in Latin America which is driven by the idea that the people of the country ought to be the beneficiaries of their resources. Now, we have to smash this down. No new nationalism. Uh, it's foreign investors who are the beneficiaries, not the people of the country. It was pretty explicit. And at that point, you could just legislate it, and they did what they were told. And so it continued, and not without uh, violence. Uh, so, for example, in the post-Stalin period, uh, violence and repression in the American U.S. dependencies in Latin America was much worse than in Eastern Europe, much worse. I see an indication of it up there, the uh, depiction of the murder of an uh, archbishop in uh, El Salvador, and, mm -hmm. and ten years later the murder of uh, six leading Latin American intellectuals. Uh, by forces pretty much armed and trained by the United States. Uh, East Europe was bad enough, but things like that didn't happen. And there were vicious neo-Nazi dictatorships installed and massive torture and so on. That was Latin America until about 10 or 15 years ago. And since then there's been a sharp turn. Partly it was the effect of the neoliberal policies of the 1980s and 90s the Latin America followed the rules, and it was smashed. The rules are very destructive. Mm -hmm. uh, countries that didn't follow the rules, like South Korea and Taiwan and so on, they did fine. Uh, but the Latin America observed them, and it was a very harsh couple of decades, and there was a reaction. There was also finally a reaction to the U.S.-backed or sometimes U.S.-imposed dictatorships. And, uh, it, and for a variety of reasons in the last roughly decade, you know, 20 years maybe, the Latin America has for the first time in its history moved towards, uh, first of all, integration, some degree of integration of the countries that were very separate from one another, and a degree of independence. And it's pretty remarkable uh, what you describe here in the NSA is one example, but there are many others. One of the most striking examples uh, had to do with the uh, CIA torture programs. The worst torture programs by far were what was called the Extraordinary Rendition. Mm -hmm. That's a program where you take somebody you sus you have, you're interested in, you suspect him or you think he has information, you send him to your favorite dictatorship. Uh, Assad in Syria, and, and Mubarak in Egypt, uh, Gaddafi in Libya, 
and make sure that he's tortured sufficiently so that he comes out with something. And then, you know, maybe have some information, maybe not. Uh, there was a study recently, about a year ago, of the countries that participated in extraordinary rendition. Most of Europe, England, Sweden, all participated, probably Italy, I don't remember. Uh, the Middle East, of course, because that's where you sent them to be tortured, and most of the rest of the world. One exception, no participation from Latin America, which is doubly significant. First of all, because Latin America used to be the backyard, and it did what they were told. Secondly, because during the period of U.S. control, Latin America was one of the world's centers of torture. Now they refuse to participate in U.S. run torture. It's pretty significant. Even Colombia? Even Colombia. You take a look at the, there are now hemispheric, hemispheric conferences used to be, uh, the U.S. gave the orders and everybody followed them. Mm -hmm. Uh, the latest ones, the U.S. and Canada are isolated. Mm -hmm. uh, it's Latin America against the U.S. and Canada. Uh, and there's already organizations formed, CELAC, which uh, exclude North America, mm -hmm. just the Latin American Caribbean countries. Uh, that's a remarkable change. And uh, the U.S. has simply lost control of the region. And it's interesting for a European because, on the contrary, I mean, it's maybe a perception that we see Europe on like laying down every, every time, getting yeah. getting more. Uh, Europe is becoming Latin Americanized. It's very. Uh, it, it was pretty dramatic with the case of the Morales Plain. This is Bolivia, mm -hmm. poorest country in, in the hemisphere outside of Haiti, uh, a, a country with an with indigenous majority. Mm -hmm. The president went to Russia, talked to Snowden, flew back. The European countries are so terrified of the United States that they wouldn't let them cross their airspace. Um, they're cowering in terror of the Europeans because the master might be angry at them. Meanwhile, Latin America, the poorest country in South America, is defying the United States. It's pretty remarkable. It's very troubling also. For it should tell Europeans something yes. about their cowardice. That's, and yeah, especially since we come from, I mean, there was a period, and during the, because you can understand that in the Cold War, there, there could be a, 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 like a legitimizing, I mean, could legitimize the, the influence of the U.S., but it's, for example, in France, it's especially since the end of the Cold War that there's been this alignment, like they enter NATO without, and it's difficult to understand what happened actually. What what was the well, France the was an, First of all, during the Cold War, uh, remember that part of the reason for NATO, significant part, was to keep Europe under control. Mm. Yeah. Uh, the uh, uh, as long as you had NATO, Europe depended on the United States and efforts to move in an independent direction, which did exist. De Gaulle, uh, uh, Willy Brandt, Ostpolitik, uh, others, were very much feared in the United States. Uh, there was fear of what was called a third force. You know, Russia, the United States, and Europe had become a third independent force, which it could have. Europe's population is bigger than the United States, and advanced industrial societies, uh, in many ways more advanced than the United States. Uh, if, they, if Europe wanted to, it could become an independent force, and the U.S. didn't want that. And that's, a, I think, a large part of the reason why NATO remains and is even expanding, though there's no Russian threat. Um, they can try to concoct one, but it's ludicrous. Uh, it's uh, uh, you know, partly to just keep Europe under control. So yes, there was, you know, pressure to. You could imagine uh, the effectiveness of propaganda about legitimizing U.S. influence, but if you look into it, it's pretty shaky. But what's happened since? I'm going to say, take France. Uh, France is quite interesting. Uh, until the 1970s, the French intellectuals were the last Stalinists in the world. Fanatic Stalinists and Maoists. Mm -hmm. I mean, nobody in the world, in the West, 
believe in any of this, but they were still mouthing all the slogans. I remember it. Mm -hmm. giving talks in France. I couldn't believe what I was hearing, talking to the leading French intellectuals about the genius Mao and so on and so forth. In the mid-70s, this radically changed. Uh, as far as I can tell, it changed. The, the event that changed it was probably Solzhenitsyn's Gulag. Uh, that was translated into French, everybody read it. And since the French intellectuals have to be in the lead in the world, because after all it's France, uh, they suddenly presented themselves as the first people in the world who understood the evils of Stalinism. And these great intellectuals were writing articles uh, with great uh, you know, self-praise about things that I knew when I was 10 years old, mm -hmm. because everybody knew them. Uh, and, uh, but there, I mean, there were obviously f factors behind it, but there was a shift among the intellectual classes from a weird form of Stalinism, third worldism, Maoism, and so on. Not everyone, of course, but you know, substantial part, to becoming uh, the most reactionary uh, uh, sector of the Western intellectuals, and of course praising themselves for their magnificence and discovering what everybody always knew. You know. mm -hmm. In fact, it's kind of comical when you look at the projections. Uh, and it continues like that. It's a very strange, this is kind of a strain of hysteria in the culture, which is interesting to investigate. I think a lot of the uh, postmodern, sometimes say excesses, uh, grow out of that. But uh, and you had similar things happening in the other countries. Uh, what the reasons are, well, be interesting to investigate, but the tendencies are clear. I, I wanted to, to ask you about, uh, coming back to this question of, uh, we talked yesterday also about the way, um, can we resist legally, or do we have to resist legally, or... or, or and there is a question, for example, secret services escape by nature to the public scrutiny and in, to, in a way is it possible to control them like through democratic means? I mean do you, the there's secret a, services? Yes, there's like a contradiction between the yeah. democracy and, and it should be controlled mm -hmm. and not just the secret services but uh, things like say Gladio uh, which is still largely secret mm -hmm. and some bits and pieces of it have come out it did to be involved in the neo-fascist uh, terror in Italy in, in the 70s and so on, probably other things. But there's not much research. Daniel Ganser in Switzerland is one of the few researchers. But that doesn't, it should be publicly exposed and under public control. Uh, and the same with the Secret Services. Uh, in the United States, after the NSA exposures, there were some measures passed in Congress to limit or restrict uh, the right of the executive to, say, spy on uh, uh, Americans, but very limited. Uh, but that's really a question of public pressure. If there's enough, it can be eliminated. But you still believe that in a broader way, I mean, because we have, we're in, a, in an era in which the state is a universal form, you st did you ever question the fact that we needed a state as a... A state altogether? Yes, like, or, or, or at the national, or just at the national level, I think... Uh, all my life, that's why mm -hmm. since uh, childhood I've been very much attracted by anarchist ideas. I, uh, the, na the nation state is not uh, some kind of universal property. Mm -hmm. It's a special construction, mainly in Europe spread over the world with European imperialism and settlement. Uh, and it's uh, in many ways a very destructive system. So take uh, take the Middle East, which is falling apart mm -hmm. and raging chaos. Uh, largely this is uh, a long-term effect of the imposition of a nation-state system by the European imperial powers, mostly England and France, mm -hmm. uh, uh, for their own interests, not for the interests of the people. So take, say, Iraq. Mm -hmm. Iraq was patched together by the British uh, in, after the Second World War, First World War, when they were kind of 
parceling out the former Ottoman Empire. It was put together in such a way as to, the boundaries were drawn by Britain mm -hmm. to ensure that England, not Turkey, would have control of the uh, oil fields uh, near the Turkish border. And uh, Kuwait was established as a British-run principality, primarily in order to bar Iraq's free access uh, to the sea. So mechanism control. Mm -hmm. And that put together uh, Shiites, uh, Sunnis, Kurds, uh, other minorities, Turkmen, uh, who weren't particularly hostile, but had basically not, not much to do with each other. This is done for imperial interest. The uh, same was true of the French took Syria, Lebanon did the same thing. The British took Palestine for geostrategic reasons primarily. It was kind of like a cover of the, the Bible said this and that. But, uh, and uh, uh, the whole reason is in, in turmoil. And if you look around, take, say, look at Africa, uh, it's, it's violence everywhere. Almost all of it, when you look at it, has to do with the nation-state systems that were imposed by the European powers for their own interests. Uh, drawing lines that uh, broke uh, tribes in half, let's say, uh, and, and putting people together who were hostile. You know. yeah. or take, say, uh, Pakistan and Afghanistan. Uh, the British, during the days when they ruled India, uh, drew a line, the Durand line, uh, for their interests. That was going to be British India, separate from the rest. The Durand line ha happens, it now separates Pakistan from Afghanistan, it cuts right through the Pashtun territories, right through. Some of them are in Pakistan, some are in Afghanistan. Uh, when a tribesman, uh, say, goes from Pakistan to Afghanistan to visit, you know, visit relatives, mm -hmm. uh, we can uh, call it a terrorist attack and send drones to kill them. But from their point of view, it's uh, that's their country. Uh, imperial power is broken in half. In fact, the same is true of the U.S. and Mexico. Uh, the U.S. conquered about half of Mexico in a brutal war of aggression in the mid-19th century. Uh, the border was pretty artificial. The same people lived on both sides. It was a very permeable border. Uh, all kinds of developments, but. Uh, it wasn't until pretty recently, late 80s and 1990s, that the border started to get militarized. And the militarization of the border, in fact, uh, took a big step forward when NAFTA was enacted. 1994, when Clinton rammed through NAFTA over public opposition, mm -hmm. uh, he also started militarizing the border uh, because uh, planners could easily understand that and NAFTA is going to create uh, a huge number of refugees in Mexico. The Mexican campesinos can be quite efficient, but they can't compete with uh, highly subsidized U.S. agribusiness. And uh, the same is true more generally. So you're going to get a flow of refugees. You have to militarize the border. Now, big issue: people crossing the border, uh, have to shoot them, send them back, and so on. Uh, and this is all over the world. So there's nothing natural about the nation-state system. I mean, you can see how unnatural it is by looking at European history. The centuries during which this system was imposed uh, were the most, some of the most savage centuries in human history. I mean, the Thirty Years' War, and maybe a third of the population of Germany was slaughtered. Uh, this is all part of imposing nation-state systems. And finally, in 1945, the Europeans did recognize that the next time they play their favorite game of slaughtering each other, it's going to be the end. Mm -hmm. uh, so Europe did finally move towards some kind of integration, which began to somewhat erode the, uh, the nation-state uh, borders, which are generally pretty artificial.
And I, I think it's a positive direction it should take place elsewhere in the world. But at the same time, it, it uh, creates an even br uh, br uh, more important distance between the people, of course, because your, your, think your thoughts are always about this relationship of power between power, established power, and, and society. And for example, we can see in Europe how the distancing between both, uh, between both has created uh, uh, even more difficulties to grasp politics for the, for the, for the society. Because other developments are taking place. Mm -hmm. like one of the things that's happening in the more integrated Europe is a very sharp attack on popular democracy. Mm -hmm. Decisions are being made in Brussels mm -hmm. uh, by the you know, the bureaucrats and uh, the Bundesbank and are imposed on the countries. Uh, when uh, Monti was elected in Italy, the population had almost nothing to do with it. It came from Brussels. Uh, when the Greek uh, Prime Minister, Papandreou, had the effrontery to suggest that there, that you might ask the population, do they want the palace policies? There was fury all over Europe. How dare you ask? population. This is decided by the responsible men in Brussels. You know. And uh, I mean, even the Wall Street Journal had an article uh, pointing out that no matter what political party took power in, in Europe, right to left, they always followed the same policy. Mm -hmm. uh, but of course, they're, com they're not coming from the country. So that's another tendency. Uh, things don't happen just mechanically. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of things going on.